I think I'm going to do this chapter that I'm going to do today, start today, in two shows. Just because it's a very long chapter and there's a lot to absorb. So I believe I can do this one in two sections or two shows. Uh, Good morning. It's Monday. Welcome to the show. Welcome to The Great Unfolding. Rob Weil here in Canada. Glad you joined me. All right. Today, this chapter that I'm going to start is called What We Were and Have Become. Right there it is. Based on Ephesians chapter 2 verses 11 through 22. Wherefore, remember that once you, the nations in flesh, who are termed uncircumcision by those termed circumcision, in flesh made by hands, that you were in that era apart from Christ, being alienated from the citizenship of Israel and guests of the promised covenant, having no expectation and without God in the world. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 11 and 12. The number five, the number of grace, is indelibly stamped on this epistle. Besides, its being the fifth of Paul's letters, as arranged in God's word, it has its key phrase, among the celestials, mentioned five times. Here in the second chapter, the same number is brought to the four again. For in the two verses quoted above, the apostle tells us in five phrases. What we Gentiles were, while later, in verses 19 through 22, he will tell us in five phrases what we have become. So it's broken down right there. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read the section, what we were, today. Then tomorrow I will read what we have become. Beautiful. Briefly, we were, number one, apart from Christ. Number two, alienated from the citizenship of Israel. Number three, guests of the promised covenants. Number four, having no expectation and without. And number five, without God in the world. We have become, number one, fellow, fellow, fellow citizens of the saints. Number two, members of God's family. Number three, built upon one foundation. Number four, part of one building, a holy temple in the Lord. And number five, the dwelling place of God's spirit. What a change it is from a state of hopelessness and alienation from God to one of being a dwelling place in his of his spirit. The intervening verses 13 through 18 tell us how this change has brought about and are prefixed by the words yet now, which I shared yesterday. In the flesh, Israel had all the privileges. Theirs were the sonship and the glory and the covenants and the legislation of the divine service and the promises. Theirs were the fathers, and out of them was the Christ according to the flesh. Romans 4, 4 and 5. These privileges imposed difficulties as far as the nations were concerned. But the yet now, which was shared yesterday, indicates that God has intervened to impose his own solution to the problem which he himself created by choosing a people out from the rest. We see a similar yet now in Romans 3.21, where God settles once and for all time the problem of sin, after first showing that humanity had reached a state of deadlock to which it could, could find no solution of its own. And again, we see a yet now in 1 Corinthians 15.20, where God finds an answer to the impasse of death, from which nobody can possibly rouse himself. God's intervention finds a solution from which all men eventually benefit, for it leads to the ultimate destruction of death itself, and the final outcome of God being all in all. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 and 28. In Ephesians 2, 13 through 18, God outlines his solution to the problem created by the distinction between Israel and the nations. His Apostle Paul had been leading up to this in his earlier letters, ever since, in fact, he had declared in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The primitive passed by, lo, there has come new. In Galatians 3.28, he had declared that in him, 
Christ, there is no Jew nor yet Greek. There is no slave nor yet free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Twice in the same epistle he declares that neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is availing anything. Galatians 5, 6 and Galatians 6, 15. And on the second of these occasions, he refers again to the new, cre new creation. In Ephesians 2, 10, we were told that we, be, we are being created in Christ Jesus. But in order to bring of this about, the barrier imposed by fleshly privilege must be destroyed so that there should be no impediment to the unity which this new creation demands. Look, let us look at these verses in more detail. Okay, so here we go. What we were. This is going to explain what we were prior to our calling. Prior to our calling. This has nothing to do with salvation. This has nothing to do that we were chosen in Christ before the disruption. I'm saying what we were in our humanity prior to our calling. So this, this is when the change began. Some are going slower than others. Some are being transformed with the man within slower than others. Some will reach maturity. Some won't. It does not matter. It does not affect your salvation whether you reach maturity or not. You are already chosen before the disruption of the world. What I'm saying is God's process is God's process. He is the one operating, not you. So you will get what you get according to God's will. And that is out of Jesus Christ's faith, the measure that's given to each. And that's what I said before on many shows. Maturity makes no difference. God will mature the ones that he has to mature. The rest who are still in the body, who are not mature, that doesn't stop them from being snatched away. They are still part of the body of Christ no matter what. Okay, what we were. Wherefore, remember that once you, the nations in flesh who are termed uncircumcision by those termed circumcision in flesh made by hands. Based on verse 11. And this is the very first verse of this uh, whole chapter that I'm going into, Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. So this goes, starts with verse 11. This clearly is addressed to the Gentile believers, those who came from the nations formerly despised by the Jews, since God had made no covenant, covenant with them, and he had with Israel their, through their father Abraham. The difficult, difficulty lay in the fact that the sign of the covenant, circumcision, had been completely misinterpreted by Abraham's descendants. Instead of seeing, it is an, an indication of the impotence of the flesh to produce that which was pleasing to God, they regard, regard it, it as a sign of fleshly exaltation and privilege. They tended to disparage those who were not circumcised. That's amazing because, yeah, this is the covenant that was made with Abraham, but they distorted it. They perverted it. They made it something good when really it was a humiliation. It was a humiliation to be circumcised in that respect. So it's exalted in the world. So you see the Jews, they have this and they think they're all that, but they're not. And that's what I'm talking about. The false Jews are doing this. They don't recognize the true covenant with Abraham. In the flesh, the Gentiles' nations were apart from Christ. For Christ, according to the flesh, came of the seed of David, Romans 1.3, and was therefore associated with Israel. Indeed, he himself said, I was not commissioned except for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15.24. And he commissioned the twelve. On the same lines, Matthew 10, 5 and 6. It was later to be written to him, of him that to his own he came, and those who are his accepted him not. John 1, 11. The nations were outside of his ministry, though as puppies they might obtain a few scraps which fell from their master's table. Matthew 15, 26, and 27. In actuality, the nations were alienated from the citizenship of Israel. 
Divine intervention was needed before Peter could accept the fact that God was about to bless the Gentiles along with his own people. See Acts chapter 10 and, and chapter 11. The nations were only guests of the promised covenants, having no expectation and without God in the world. The word here translated guests is the Greek X-E-N-O-N, meaning lodger, and is applied to one who is lodging as a guest or stranger in another family while away from home. In other passages, it is translated stranger. Matthew 25, 35, 20, chapter 25, 35, 38, 43, and 44. Also see chapter 27, verse 7, and Hebrews 11, 13, and John, uh, 3 John, chapter 5, or no. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, and chapter 3, or verse 3, I don't know, and John 5. Never mind. <laughs> it's just all these references to that word stranger. Here in Ephesians, it is translated strangers in the King James Version, and there, and, the, and there does seem to be an element of estrangement implicit in the term. The nations were outside of the family of Israel and consequently had no expectation since all the promises from the time of Abraham onwards had been made to Israel. <clears throat> the phrase, without God, in one word, in Greek, atheos, or A-T-H-E-O-S, from which we get the word atheist. That's interesting. It is the only time it is used in the Greek scriptures. Can there be any more forlorn situation as that described in this verse, having no expectation and without God in the world? Wow. Contrast this with the status of Israel at that time whose is the sonship and the glory of the covenants and the legislation of the divine service and the promises, whose are the fathers and out of whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all, God be blessed for the eons, amen. Romans chapter 9 verses 4 and 5. But now God proposes to effect a change, so that believers out of Israel and those from among the nations shall shed their distinctions. Male, female, Jew, Greek, all that. That's the distinctions it's talking about. And enjoy the same blessings and share the same expectation. Though both the blessings and the expectation will be far more lofty and far more glorious than those previously enjoyed by Israel in respect of the kingdom. In the next few verses, all distinctions are nullified, all divisions destroyed, and a new humanity is created in which no disunion exists. So, tomorrow I will finish this up and I will go into how the change takes place. This is awesome. And then it goes into what we are now, which is even more awesome. So this is perfect. I split this up on purpose. So we've got to realize what we were and what we are to become. How the change takes place. This is very interesting for our walk. Very interesting for our calling. Understanding that we go through a process. We all do. When we're first called, we go through a process. It's a realization of how God is operating and how God is changing us. Because only God can change us. And you got to understand, true repentance is a change of mind. And only God can give you a change of mind. He can change your behavior. And he does that from the man within. And this is what's happening. And it's beautiful. So I love it. I see it in my own self. Understand, being a member of the body of Christ, being a believer for 25 years, it's a process. And it took a long time for me to even get to this point where I'm able to share videos, where I'm able to put myself out there and herald the evangel. It took me a long time. I've only been doing this for two and a half years. And I realized that God needed to change me and bring me and change me from the man within in order to bring me to a point of maturity to be able to share the evangel and herald it. And I believe those who are mature are able to do this. If you're doing it and you're immature and you don't really understand and you don't really realize, you're going to be all over the place. Your teaching is going to be all over the place. It's not sound. And this is what I'm talking about. You need to be solid and solid on the foundation of Christ. 
and the realization that God is the one operating, not you. He is the one operating through you to be able to even give you the ability to do this stuff here, to share the evangel, to do a channel. You know, anybody can say anything on YouTube. As you know, YouTube is a wide network, and there's a lot of junk out there. The reason why I'm on YouTube in the first place because I'm reaching people, and that was a good example of reading, uh, uh, reaching Sophie Greetman over in Israel. Like, it's amazing, you know, how God works, and God works amazingly and brilliantly. We have nothing to say about that. Our own inabilities, our own inabilities. Recognize your own inability and realize that it's God's strength, God's ability, not yours. I love you all. Have a beautiful Monday, and we will talk to you tomorrow and finish that chapter up.